Today is a day of reflection on languages. And we wanted to consider that as America is a nation of in immigrants with a rich linguistic life, it struggles between English, the language of communication, and the other languages that unify American communities and influence the ways in which they understand their American experience. With a second or a third or more languages, writers have the ability to, to choose language in their crafting of literature. They have the influence of language upon them, unconsciously, sometimes consciously, in, in attention or in a way that complements what they're trying to create. And we wanted to get to the bottom of that so that maybe we could all better understand our creativity. And so today we invite an accomplished panel of writers to share with us their experiences in the shadow of more than one language. Our moderator is Kathy Park Hong. She's a Korean American from Los Angeles and Brooklyn. Her verse plays with actual and invented dialect, um, document the world history and the, hist and the world of the future. Her first book, Translating Mon was published in 2002, and her second collection, Dance Dance Revolution, was chosen for the Barnard Women's Poets Prize in 2007. She's also a recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, and a Village Voice Fellowship for Minority Reporters. Her poems have been published in a public space, Paris Review, and many other journals. And she has reported for the Village Voice, The Guardian, Salon, and Christian Science Monitor. She lives in New York City, and she's assistant professor at Sarah Lawrence College. Randa Gerard was born in Chicago to an Egyptian Greek mother and a Palestinian father. Having spent her childhood in Kuwait and Egypt, she returned to the United States in the early 90s and began attending Sarah Lawrence College at 16. Prodigy. <laughs> 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 she had her son two years later. After earning her master's in Middle Eastern studies, she began writing her first novel, A Map at Ho of Home, at age 23. A Map of Home won the Hopwood Award and Gosling Prize at the University of Michigan, where she received her MFA in fiction. Her short stories have appeared in magazines, including Plowshares and the New York Times magazines. She was part of Beirut 39, celebrating the 35, nine, 35, the 39 most gifted Arab or, um, writers of Arab origin under the age of 40. Roger Sederat is an Iranian-American poet. He received his BA in sociology from Austin and an MA in creative writing from Queens College and a PhD from Tufts University. He is currently assistant professor teaching poetry and translation in the MFA program at Queens College. He's the author of the poetry collection, Dear Regime, Letters to the Iranian Republic, which was winner of Ohio University Press's Hollis Sumner Prize. He also has a chapbook, From Tehran to Texas, and a forthcoming book on the history of landscape in modern New England poetry. Bernardo Atasha was born in Basque Country, Spain, studied economics at Bilbao University, and later studied philosophy at University of Barcelona. He has written several novels, short story collections, poetry collections, articles, and children's books, in addition to work in script writing and, theor and theater. He writes both in Basque and in Sp Spanish. Atasha published his first book of poems, translated as The Cities, in 1976, and two years later, Ethiopia, for which he won the Critics' Prize. He has collections of short stories, as well as novels, which are award-winning. He's a recipient in 1989 of Span's Na Spain's National Literature Prize, and, it has, um, and he is also the recipient of the 2008 Mandela Prize. Francisco Stork, or Francisco Javier Aguayas, was born in Monterrey, Mexico. And as a child, he moved throughout Mexico, first with his mother and then with mother and stepfather. Immigrating to El Paso, Texas when he was nine, he learned English in grammar school. A scholarship earner, 
first to the local Jesuit high school and then later to Spring Hill College. He studied English literature and philosophy and earned a fellowship to study Latin American literature at Harvard. He went to Columbia Law School and after graduating has worked as a lawyer and continu continued to write fiction. His four published novels, The Way of the Jaguar, Behind the Eyes, Marcello in the Real World, and The Last Summer of the Death Warriors. We'd also like to recognize our interpreter today. Um, she's up in the box, Nancy Adler. She is going to be helping out with Senora Atasha today. Thank you so much to her and to all the interpreters who make it possible for the events to be so rich. I hand over to Ms. Park. Hi, um, so I'm going to be moderating the event. I'll just be asking questions to a lot of these uh, amazing writers I'm surrounded by. But I guess I will start off and, you know, I'll just like read a couple poems from my first collection, Translating Mom. Um, and this is a book that really kind of uh, dealt more explicitly just coming from two different cultures, you know, um, coming from, um, you know, coming from a bilingual background, uh, Korean and English background. And so I was trying to decide what to read. And I thought <laughs> just, you know, just to, I'm going to, I'm just going to read a playful poem. Um, it's about these Siamese twins called Ch Chang and Ang. And it sort of kind of um, exemplifies a split that I felt. So I'll just read this and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Randa. Ontology of Chang and Ang, the original Siamese twins. Chang spoke, Ang paused. Chang threw a beach ball, Ang caught it. Chang told a white lie, Ang got caught for the lie. Chang forgot his first language, Ang picked up English. In letters, Chang referred to themselves as I, Ang as we. While proselytizing, the preacher asked Chang, do you know where you go after you die? Chang said, yes, yes, up there. Thinking they didn't understand, he asked, do you know where I go after I die? Ang said, yes, yes, down there. Ang married Adeline. I mean, Chang married Adeline. I mixed them up too. Ang married her sister Sally. Chang made love to his wife. Ang daydreamed about money, his Siam childhood, and roast beef. He tried not to get aroused. Chang checked his watch, scratched his head, and fidgeted. Ang made love to his wife. Chang became drunk, knocked Ang out with a whiskey bottle, and went carousing with his boys. Ang was unconscious. Chang proved Einstein's time dilation while drunkenly running from one bar to the next. Ang was unconscious. Chang apologized. Ang grudgingly accepted. Chang paused, Ang spoke, Chang interrupted. I am my own man, Ang echoed, we are men, yes. Both broke their bondage with their pitchman, Mr. Coffin. Both owned land in North Carolina and 40 slaves. Both were nostalgic for Siam, childhood of preserving duck eggs, watching tiger and elephant fights with the king, Mother Nock, who loved them equally. The physicians were surprised to find both were personable. Both did not appreciate the outhouse joke. Are all Orientals joined? Allow me to stick this very sharp pin in Eng's neck to see if both of you feel the pain. Is it true that you turn babies into cabbages? We are nice civilized people. We offer you bananas. Both were sick of fascination. Both woke up, played checkers, sired children, owned whips for their slaves, shot game, ate pie. Both were, wore French black silk, smoked cigars, flirted. Both believed in the tenets of individualism. Both listed these activities to the jury and cried, see, we are American. Both were released with a $500 fine for assaulting another headhunter. Both were very self-aware. Both insisted on an iron casket so that grave robbers would not dig up their bodies and sell them to the highest bidder. Both did not converse with one another except towards the end. My lips are turning blue, Ang. Ang did not answer. They want our bodies, Ang. Ang did not answer. Ang, Ang, my lips are turning blue. Ang turned to his body and did not answer.
turn it over to Rhonda. Are we all no. reading? Is that oh, part of what we're doing? Oh, uh, no, no, no. So everyone's going to talk for about three minutes, and you could either read your work, an excerpt of your work, or you could just talk in general about, you know, your background and how it's affected your writing. So Okay, I'm going to actually uh -huh. read part of my novel because it's going to answer mm -hmm. a lot of mm -hmm. stuff. It's semi-autobiographical, and this is um, mm -hmm. the chapter in my novel where Nadali... The character, mm -hmm. the narrator, just moved to America. Um, she's been learning English in British schools uh, in Kuwait and in Egypt, so she doesn't really have uh, a problem so far with uh, the English, but she's having a lot of problems mm -hmm. with her family being crazy and her friends at school being jerks. Okay, so the name of this chapter is You're a 14 year old Arab chick who just moved to Texas, and I'm just gonna read a couple of, for a couple of minutes. That fall you move with your family to America, you are diagnosed with TB. I don't know if, like, I just, we had to take these tests as soon as we moved here, and that was part of it. The fall you move with your family to America, you are diagnosed with t TB, and the old white doctor points at the five inch red rectangle on your forearm and announces, that should be three inches smaller. He puts you on a battery of medications, which worsens your pimples, makes you gain 30 pounds, and gives you an overall sense of impending death. As usual, your mama is jealous of you and wants to be the one dying instead. For the first few weeks there, it's her first time without a piano and your first time without friends to, com to comfort you. TV is full of commercials, and your family goes to McDonald's too often. When you go through the drive through uh, your father, who still has problems with his P's and B's, inspects his cheeseburgers and finds them with pickles, backs the car up and yells into the intercom, I said no bickles, you pitch. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to the movies, you have to explain to your parents why the jokes are funny. Long after the credits begin to roll, the three of you sit in the dark, you translating the movie's murder mystery into Arabic. There's nothing sadder than a 14-year-old explaining a movie to her middle-aged parents. In America, you think, not understanding a movie is the same as being illiterate. It could break your heart if you really think about it. So you should never think about it. You should just go to school, eat your lunch on the floor outside the library, then go into the library and spend the rest of the period reading the dictionary. Um, so this is more of an exaggerated version of um, the misery that I encountered when I first uh, moved to the States in 91. Um, and part of that misery came from the fact that the, um, the first Gulf War had just happened. So people were looking at Arabs as like, you know, camel jockeys, and they would call um, me and my brother and my sister names and stuff like that. So in addition to dealing with just being really confused <laughs> uh, because there was culture shock to begin with. Um, we were also dealing with this other issue. And then I feel like um, people said that I spoke like I was on NPR, you know, because I'd been like <laughs> learning English <laughs> in an English school. So I'd be like, what are you having for lunch? And they'd be like, shit, why do you talk like that? You know, like they were just <laughs> mad at me. So I felt like even though I spoke English, I didn't speak English. I didn't speak the language of the kids that were around me. Um, so I was, I felt like an outcast. Um, I don't know if I'd, I'd like to stop there and pass it on. Um, so let me, uh, I guess it's, this like, yeah, perfect. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Habla más largo, dice. I'd like to just, uh, I know that probably Maybe some of you are having a, 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 are in a situation that I was in when I first came to the United States from Mexico, you know, trying to learn another language. And maybe um, some of you are struggling in school, trying to figure out what's going on in the classes. Raise your hands if you, uh, some of you are having that. No, everybody's doing well. <laughs> There's a couple there. So, you know, instead of reading to you, I'd like to just tell you just a little bit of a story of, of, um, of um, my own story of coming to the United States and, and actually how I got started writing, which in, in a way is related to um, my, tr my problems with, uh, with, with learning the English language. Um, I was born in Mexico, 
and I was uh, I didn't know my father. My mother was a single mother, and so I I grew up in in in, in Mexico for about six years until this um, this man who was from the United States was traveling, and he met my mother and decided to marry her, and adopt me, and a few years later. He decided that it would be great for this uh, this three person family to come to the United States, so that I could, you know, so that I could uh, grow up learning English, you know, the land of the land of opportunity, right? And uh, we came to uh, uh, in El Paso, Texas. I didn't know any English beforehand. Like we came in a, around a June, I think, and I was supposed to enter school in in August, so I had about two months to uh, to get ready for school. Um, I was in the sixth grade at the, at the time when I came from the United States. And as soon as I entered uh, school, it became obvious that I was, I was totally lost. I, I just, uh, I had these books that I was, uh, that I was trying to read that I, I had absolutely no idea what was going on. And it was embarrassing that everybody else around the class knew English. They knew the answers. And, you know, I didn't know the answers, which is, for me, it was it was doubly embarrassing because I was a, a very, um, you know, I read a lot when I was in Mexico. I used to read whatever I could get my hands on, and uh, here I was, just just totally um, uh, insignificant. Um, one of the things that, that the Texas school system had at that time, which uh, was was that they had a rule that, in order to make people um, learn English fast, they would punish them if they would catch you speaking Spanish. And so, if they would, uh, if you would speak Spanish in the, in the uh, in the playground, you were taken to the principal's office, and uh, you were uh, you were whacked in the behind with this board that had little holes in it. And so that uh, you know that uh, that that's no longer there. You know, I can tell you. How. <laughs> um, but one of the things that that does is that it, you know it makes you feel like your own language is 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 not worthy of uh, of being uh, uh, of being spoken, you know. And it, it uh, when you're uh, when you're 13 years old, that kind of like sifts into your into your mind. And so, throughout uh, throughout my life and throughout some of the books, I think some of that is probably is probably still there. You know that that sense that I that I need to somehow show. That uh, I've mastered the English language, and that I can, um, you know, that I can that I can write, um, and it's and it's a it's a good it's a good thing, you know. When what the you tend to to try to comp overcompensate. Mm -hmm. How I started writing really is kind of an interesting story because I know that that you might identify with. I was uh, I was a, a freshman in high school, and. I had a crush on this girl who was just very, very beautiful in my own <laughs> mind, and her name was Betty. She had she had lovely red hair, and um, I remember the, still remember the time she worked at a Dairy Queen, and uh, trying to work out my um, my courage to ask her out for a for a date. I would go in there, I would buy a milkshake, and then I would drink it, and, and I still didn't have the courage to do it. I'd go try go back again and. Uh, ask for a hamburger, you know, I go back. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure I was, after a while I said, look, I got to do this one way or another, right? I mean, what's what's the worst that can happen? Well, I mean, the worst that can happen is pretty bad in, if, you're, <laughs> if you're a freshman in high school. But I decided to go there, uh, and I asked her out for this, um, I asked her out for a date. And uh, to my amazement, she said yes. You know? So I think at that moment I was like floating up in the air a little bit. And I walked out, and all that week I I, um, I I collected cans, you know, so I could sell them, so that I would have enough money for the for this uh, Saturday date. Uh, I got a, a friend of mine to uh, to drive us, washed his car and polished it, and did all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Saturday came along, and uh, it was Saturday morning, and, I, and there was this 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 uh, this phone call, and uh, they tell me that. Uh, there somebody was on the phone, um, and it was Betty, you know. And, and Betty said, "You know, I'm sorry, but um, I can't really go out with you tonight." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, you, my parents don't let me go out with Mexicans." So it's 
I tell you that story just so, so not so that you feel sorry for me, <laughs> but because that night I, I took my I took a journal and I started writing this this very uh, uh, sentimental poem about heartbreak mm -hmm. um, and uh, and what it what it was especially when it's so totally unfair because I had a feeling that Betty you know that Betty liked me and the reasons she was giving me for for not going out with me were uh, were not uh, you know they just didn't seem right. Um, and uh, I wrote uh, I wrote this poem, and I happened to like uh, after that keep on writing uh, in this journal. And I've kept uh, I kept journals pretty much writing every day of my life until uh, a book uh, was published um, when I was forty five years old. And the reason that the book uh, I, I believe that the, the journal served as a as a practice um, towards writing. So now I am. Uh, I am very grateful for uh, for Betty in in some ways because <laughs> she's responsible for this uh, uh, um, for the for um, for what started to be a, a habit of uh, of doing the writing. So I'll end there, and hopefully you'll have some uh, some questions later. Okay, Bernardo. Hello. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much to be here. So I'm, I'll try to, to read a short test in my broken English. Okay? Mm -hmm. About all language. Language. Verbal language begin with the sound of the second syllable of the alphabet. I mean with the sound of the B. B, 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 B. Chronologically, is the first sound in the baby's lips. Because of that, baby is baby with two B. In Spanish, is bebe. In Spanish, also baba, spider. Yeah. Yeah. In Arabic, bab. In Basque, you can find the word obaba with two Bs in many lullabies. After that, after the B, the other sounds, language. An ancient Greek philosopher wrote that the human being was a language animal. I mean, it means an animal who is, first of all, made by words. Besides, an animal who has this tall, tall instrument, language to express himself and to communicate with others, with his equals. Dogs, monkeys, birds, they have also expression. And sometimes we say that they speak and they understand. Of course, we are using metaphors. Dogs, monkeys, birds never will be able to understand concepts like love, never could understand the story of my friend Francisco. Uh, uh, they are not able to understand concepts like rich or poor. Uh, never will learn what is exactly what we called metaphor. Language is decisive to become a human being. Remember the case of the wild children found in the forest after many years without any contact with any people, with the society. Remember, for instance, the case of the boy named Victor Daveyron, L'Enfant Sauvage Daveyron. He was forsaken by his parents in the forest. When he was 15 or 16, he got hunted, and this is the exact word, because I have read the description uh, in the place where he was catched, and the expression in French is Isi chasse, eh? hunted. Here, had been hunted. Mm? So when he was 15 or 16 uh, years old, he was hunted. 
The boy was brought to an institution led by Jan Itar, a doctor who is now in the history of the medicine uh, for his enormous help to deaf and dumb children. Jan Itar, the doctor, tried to transform the shul, the spirit of Victor, who was at this time a person without verbal language. But it wasn't, it was too late. The boy was ena enabled to spread out, to, to extend, to generalize uh, the meaning of the word. There is a very moving moment when the doctor, the doctor Ita, tried to learn to Victor uh, what is a book, what uh, thing is a book. And every day he showed him a book telling it's a book, book, remember? Book. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the doctor asked to Victor, uh, no, ask for, ask for a book. Uh, please bring me a book. And um, Victor is enabled to, to, to bring this book because in his mind, book is just the concrete book that Itard used to show what he is. He can understand the abstract concept of the book. So, Victor is a sad story, never turned into a human being. But we are not like Victor. We can distinguish between abstract and concrete. We can distinguish between language and language as Russian, Spanish, English, Basque, and another. So in my case, well, but before that, I think that, of course, is essential, is crucial to have a language to become a human being. But it's not so crucial, but it's important. Eh? Which kind of language, the concrete language we receive at home and alone our childhood. In my case, the language I received when I was a child, baby, eh, bebo, bibabu, when it was the Basque language. And I think in my life, it had been a very, very important fact. Why? Well, telling in my true in two minutes. Mm, when I was a child, my language was prohibited, was forbidden. I remember uh, once with my mom waiting for a tramway, trolebus in Spanish, waiting for a tramway. And my mother was speaking bus with a friend. And at this moment, a man, maybe a police, a secret police, maybe a fascist, uh, uh, came to them and say, don't speak that. Speak Spanish, we are in Spain. So 20 years later, 20 years later, I tried to publish a literary magazine written in Basque. And two days later, the, the magazine was kidnapped, was, was forbidden, eh, because eh, I use the Basque language. Uh, Bertolt Brecht wrote that no one wants to hear about the, the crooked tree, the crooked tree, arbol torcido, the crooked three. Ah, the crooked three. And this kind of truth, uh, uh, I mean the situation of my language in the past, never at this moment, or nowadays, no one wants to hear about it. But it's a fact. And it's a fact, and in my opinion, it's a very serious fact. Of course, Spanish is also my first language is my second third language. In Latin we say primus inter pares is the Basque and the second first is Spanish. But 
uh, it's no uh, to be bilingual uh, such uh, strange things as we are bilingual to be bilingual is no a uh, very comfortable situation uh, because around us people don't want uh, hate i think the bilingual situations uh, is my feeling after so many years uh, speaking two languages so is no maybe this decisive is not fatal but languages are very the concrete languages are also very important after the bi ba be bo bu the, the first moments in our life well is my first statement mm -hmm. thank you so i just uh, speak briefly and read a very short poem uh i grew up in texas for the most part my my father's iranian my mother's american and those two countries right now for a long time politically have been at odds so i'm a gemini so it makes sense you know and self-hatred uh anyway um it was hard growing up in texas i uh i identified as iranian american so i'm like biracial or they call it a hybrid identity and uh, didn't quite fit in among all my Iranian relatives that would come to visit and the Iranian community in Texas, and didn't quite fit in in America in, you know, Texas either. So it was kind of a struggle. And um, I was just thinking too, like, I know it's a struggle for, for various reasons to have two cultures, at least two cultures, two languages. But and also the opposite is true, especially in American culture, that it can actually be a very uh, strengthening position to kind of be between two things. And one example of that, so I have three names basically growing up in Texas as a kid. Uh, Roger, which is like, I, I hated Roger because it's so bland, you know, it's like Roger. Like, it's just assume like I'm a plain white guy, you know, Roger. Uh, and then uh, my my friend, I had kind of like a lot of violence in my home and I grew up at my best friend's house. Uh, it's Mexican-American a family of immigrants, the Martinez family. And I lived, I took trips with them. I lived over there. And I loved going to Benji's, Mar Benji Martinez's house because I wasn't Roger anymore. I was Rogelio, like with three explanation points, you know? And it, it felt like this identity, you know? And I, you should go by Rogelio, you know? So I love that. And then in Persian, uh, among my Iranian family, I was Haji, you know? And I still am. Like when I go to Iran, I'm Haji and, you know, they, my, my aunt doesn't call me Roger. So it's just, it kind of speaks to these different places we inhabit. And I never felt like I fit in, but as a writer, and I, I see this with the musicians, with artists, I see it in Bob Marley's story. You know, when you're a creative person, that creativity can kind of turn all of that struggle into something really great, you know? And um, maybe if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I grew up, so in Texas, and it was hard because there was this big revolution in Iran Iran's controlled by this religious theocracy right now. Uh, so many uh, friends and, and writer uh, colleagues could be in this chair. There's more, more writers in prison in Iran right now than anywhere in the country, uh, anywhere in the world, I'm sorry. So I grew up in this big revolution happened in 1979. Uh, they took a lot of Americans hostage in the embassy. And so there were these images every day of people in Iran burning American flags. and. Um, American hostages with uh, with blindfolds on, and everybody in America started hating Iran, you know. And my father uh, got a lot of uh, trouble uh, in, in life growing up in San Antonio, Texas. And I was a little kid, I'd pick up the phone, and people in Texas accents would tell me my family had 24 hours to leave or they were going to burn our house down, our cars were, the windows were smashed, uh, beaten up at school and all that stuff. It all sounds very tragic, and it was, but it's, it was also kind of now it's very empowering in some ways to have that. And, um, and the last thing I'll say, I, I grew up into Persian. My father didn't want me to associate with Iran at all. And what do you do when your parents tell you not to do something, right? I'm like, I'm going to find out about Iran. And I married an Iranian woman now, you know, and I went to Iran. I'm a dual citizen of, you know, America and Iran. And uh, this is this poem I'll read and then I'll, I'll stop. It's called A Villanelle. And in French, it's interesting being like an Iranian American and writing in a French form. It has these recurring rhymes and recurring lines. And I know like in American culture, even if poetry doesn't do it for you, um, like Walt Whitman took the Bible, right, and like kind of scooped it out in some ways and wrote his own poetry. Uh, there was this movie about Ray Charles called Ray. Uh, and you know, I don't know if you saw Jamie Foxx played Ray Charles. 
And in the movie, he's like playing church music in this hotel room and with one of his zillion girlfriends, right? And he starts singing kind of racy stuff about sex. And his girlfriend's like, Ray, that's church music. You know, a few years ago, Kanye West had this song, and out of nowhere, like in his rap, he interjects John Denver. John Denver, man. I mean, John Denver is like the squarest white country boy. And in the middle of it, John, uh, Kanye West, like, baby, I'm leaving on an airplane. You don't know when I'll be back again. Those kind of things, like bilingualism kind of can, have, can do that in America in really great ways. Poetry does that. And so I just think it's interesting, like being a poet, writing in Persian, and I translate from Persian, and also writing in English, I'm filling up this French form. It's kind of like a mini revolution of sorts. That's what poets like to do, those kind of mm. things, especially in America. So it's San Antonio, 1979, about my childhood. Iranians never escaped that year. My father said, tell people you're from France. For an eternity, I'm forced to hear this kid in third grade science named Pierre asking, ça va? I didn't have a chance. Iranians never escape. That year, they dragged me down the hallway by my hair, blindfolded, screaming in Texas accents. For an eternity, I'm forced to hear, hey, Ayatollah, you're not welcome here. The US is for us. As immigrants, Iranians never escape that. Year to year, we relive it whenever we're in an airport and get looked at askance for an eternity. I'm forced to hear customs detaining my father declare, it's just routine. Voices that turn a man's ear on eons never escape that year. For an eternity, I'm forced to hear. Thanks. At this time, many of you have headsets that will allow for you to receive translation. We have a small number of headsets remaining. If there are people who need translation, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand and you keep it high. I cannot guarantee a headset for everyone, but we'll pass out as many as possible. Okay. And while we're checking and to see who wants headset, I'm going to pass the mic along to you, the audience. We have students here from have, who have many language backgrounds, and I want for the, um, the authors to hear Mm -hmm. What is your language? What is your primary language? And from what country of origin is your use of language? So, I'll start us off. <laughs> oh, come on. Stop playing. <laughs> okay. Um, I am from China oh. and I speak Chinese, Mandarin. Mm. Uh, I'm Ecuadorian and I speak Spanish. Mm. I'm from Guatemala and I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I'm from Nepal and I speak Nepali. Mm. My name is Kevin. I'm from Guatemala and I also speak Spanish. Well, I'm from Guatemala as well and I speak Spanish. I'm Marisela and I'm from Mexico and I also speak Spanish. I'm from Guatemala and I speak Spanish. I'm <laughs> Luce and I speak Spanish from Dominican Republic. I'm from Dominican Republic and I speak Spanish. Uh, I wasn't born in Guatemala and I speak Spanish. I'm Dominican and I speak Spanish. Quite good, quite good. I'm Dominican and I speak Spanish. I'm from Santo Domingo and I speak Spanish. I'm from Yemen and I speak Arabic. I'm from Dominican Republic and I speak Spanish too. I'm Dominican and I speak Spanish. I'm Dominican Republic, please Hispanic. <laughs> I'm Dominican, speak Spanish. Can you say it again? <laughs> 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 um, I'm Dominican and I speak Portuguese. <laughs> 
<laughs> variety then. Actually, I do. You do? Yeah. Any other languages? Um, do we have any multilingual people? People with two or more languages under belt? I can't say sign language is short. <laughs> <laughs> but you do know a little American Sign Language as well? I don't know sign language. I, all I know is like a sign language. Like anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a little bit of a diversity in the audience, and yet there are some unifying groups as well. So this is your audience, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's actually really exciting that all of you come from these bilingual backgrounds and that, you know, I mean, most of you, <laughs> the Dominican sector over there. But, like, you know, everyone speaks Spanish or, you know, or you have Chinese or, you know, in the, ba in, um, in the classroom. Because, like, you know, I grew up in L.A. and I, um, I grew up in Koreatown. And so I didn't speak English until, you know, I was in school. But then I moved to until I was, like, seven or so. But then when I went moved to another neighborhood, it was, like, an all-white neighborhood. And there was, like, I wasn't surrounded by kids who spoke other languages. It was just a bunch of white kids. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to speak English, so they dumped me in the special ed class with, like, a deaf person and, like, someone who had Down syndrome. So I thought I was retarded, basically, for not, <laughs> not for not, so, but, like, I didn't have that kind of community. So it's just, it's very exciting that all of you have that sort of community. But um, I was, but it seems like with all of you, um, what I notice is that, you know, you b all of you come from this, um, you, you know, Francisco, you were talking about how you had to sort of master the English language. And there's all there was a lot of kind of you all came from sort of these sucky situations. You know, you talk about like ha sounding like an M NPR person, or <laughs> you know, or, um, you know, people calling you a camel jockey. And you talk about you, um, Bernardo, you talking about coming from like uh, the conflict in Basque and Spanish and. How and Roger, you were talking about how you were able to turn that struggle into something great. And how have you turned? How is that sense of alienation or that discomfort in the language? How has that affected your writing in general? Or do you? Um, do you? Um, is that? Do you see? Um, has that affected your expression in your writing? I I have a I have a very short answer. Um, I think. The very best writers are observers. Mm -hmm. So when you're not part of a group, when you're allowed to sit on the, on the margins of something, looking in, you can see things that people inside the group can't see. So for me, I feel like I'm an inf infiltrator. Mm -hmm. When I hang out with wh white people, they think I'm white. So they're like, mm -hmm. oh, those Arabs. I'm like, when I hang out with Arabs, you know, they're like, oh, they want to talk, you know, if they want to be homophobic, they'll be homophobic. When I hang out with, and then I, I can hang out with my queer community, and I can hang out. So mm -hmm. I'm part of so many different communities. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about that is that I don't feel like I have a people, right? I don't feel like I have a group that I belong to. But that's also the good part, because when I don't belong to a group, I get to see the group and I get to observe the group and that's what good writing is. Good writing is, un, not, it's not just unbiased, it's just the ability to see stuff that other people don't see, right? I mean, that's, when you read something beautiful, what you're really moved by is someone actually speaking out and really capturing something that you've never really seen captured before, a thought or an idea or an observation and that's what good writing is. So for me, I find myself to be lucky in a way to be a, an in-between person because that's a place where my writing can flourish and where I can really um, be, I guess, free. Bueno, yo, yeah, I would like to. Mm, bueno, aprovechando que estoy en, en el Instituto Cervantes y que muchos de ustedes hablan castellano español, solo voy a decir dos palabras sobre la cuestión. La primera es que se fijen, hablando de lenguaje y, y hablando de cómo en el lenguaje todo lo que ocurre en la sociedad queda como escrito, como pegado. Por ejemplo, fíjense que dumb en inglés es al mismo tiempo, creo, mudo y persona de pocas luces, ¿no? Es decir, que normalmente si una persona no tiene lenguaje, eso equivale, como ella ha dicho, 
a una marginalidad, eh, puede ser una marginalidad física o puede ser una marginalidad intelectual, pero es lo mismo, es decir, el lenguaje va unido incluso a nuestra eh, inteligencia o a la mirada que los demás ¿no? sobre nosotros en cuanto a la inteligencia. Y en segundo lugar, yo, yo quiero decir que el hecho de ser bilingüe, lo que le da a uno es más horas de conversación sobre la lengua. O sea, es decir, creo que yo he hablado sobre la lengua con mis amigos, con mi mujer, con mis hijas, con mis colegas, muchísimas horas más que aquellos que son únicamente monolingües. Creo tener más experiencia de la lengua que la gente que solo habla una lengua, sencillamente. The, uh, the question about how our alienation, how has how's that become in our, helped us with our books. For me, it's, it's allowed me to create characters that, that are also um, kind of uh, different. Uh, in this book that I just last, that I wrote, there's a boy that is full of anger because somebody, um, he thinks that somebody killed his sister. And I'm pretty sure that in writing, in, in trying to write that book, I had to tap at some of my own, you know, experiences of anger when I was when I was growing up, and so it's allowed me to. When you're writing a book, it allows you to imagine what what other people may be feeling, and you know, I think that we all we are, we all experience, regardless of whether we speak a certain language or not. I think as human beings, mm -hmm. if you if you look deeply into yourself, you are going to recognize a feeling of not belonging, um, and. Uh, And, and tapping into that, uh, paying special attention to it because of, because of your ability to fit in because of a language creates a special sensitivity mm -hmm. that, that can later be incorporated into a book. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, just for uh, speaking to that question too, my dad, my father came from Iran when he was 16, like a teenager, and he had a similar s experience to what Kathy was talking about. Like they failed him twice in high school. Uh, and he was like a star student in his home country. And he, you know, learned to figure, I think you have to figure things out when you're in that position, you know, and, and figure the world out. And he went on to get a PhD in psychology, you know, from a type, top school and become like a real uh, stellar kind of um, accomplished person. And more than that, like, I, through his eyes, like the eyes of an immigrant, he showed me this country, like we would take long road trips. He's like, get in the Buick, you know, and we drive to Ohio from Texas. And He'd point out things and like fig show me America in a way that only he could kind of see that because it was new to him. And then it was kind of the reverse for me when I went to Iran. I was like new to the the culture very much so in, in the home country and looking around. And then as a writer, uh, and I'll conclude with this, you know, Persian, I know Spanish has some things that only Spanish can do. You know, as I, I work in a translation program and we have Spanish translators And they're just, you know, the emotion of, of Spanish, like Rogelio versus Roger, in prose, like the cadence, the rhythm of the lines and things. And English kind of shortens that and clips that and kind of makes it matter of fact. And it's a similar thing in Persian in its own way. Like, Persian sings. When you go to the great shrines, they love poetry so much in Iran that a guy that's been dead for a thousand years, there's people there that you go here, you, you go to, there's people at the grave and the music is playing of the poetry. And it rhymes. And rhyme kind of got out of favor in American poetry for a while. And even the poets that like do rhyme and call themselves formalists, they can seem stuffy to me. And so inhabiting two languages now, I like to go and see what Iran is doing and then bring it to America and then vice versa. And music does this too. Like jazz started, it's African-American music. And then it went all over the world, you know, and people started to adapt in South America and like Brazilian in, uh, in all of these different ways, jazz kind of morphs and changes. And so I like that. And in my book, that's what I did. Like I, I took rhyme and I took the music of Persian and put it in English. And it's kind of an untapped way I kind of found to, to be a, a different kind of writer for myself. You know, and I found my identity once I started picking up the pen and writing. So. Great. I mean, actually, maybe some of um, you know, other um, some of you can also talk about that. I mean, have you? I mean, you talk about how you use rhyme and music and how you incorporated it in that. I mean, of course, um, all of you write, uh, except for you, Bernardo, write in the English language. But do you feel like you borrow from your parent culture or your the old culture and incorporate it into your writing? I, 
uh, one of the things that happens uh, mm -hmm. when you try to learn a new language is that you, your, your mental processes have to slow down a little bit because you're, you're mm -hmm. translating. Mm -hmm. And so you look at, a, you look at an object and, and you say, silla, mm -hmm. but it has, you know, what's the word in English? Mm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, you know, you can't, you can't come up with it right away. And somehow I think that, you know, through time, my brain has become just slower. <laughs> 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 and, and that translates into the, into the writing itself. I, I tend to write, you know, in, in, simple, in simple sentences. Uh, and uh, it's probably because the, that's the only way I can write. You know, at some point in my life when I was, when I was trying to learn a new language, I had to, like, simplify things in my, in my mind so that, I could, so that I could understand it and so that I could communicate uh, to them, and so uh, I never thought about it until I, I was invited to this panel, and I had to do some thinking about some of the questions that you might ask, so thank you very much. Uh, but I think that the act of translation uh, actually um, influenced uh, how, some of the, how some of the writing comes out. Even now, when I want, when I want to convey a lot of, uh, a lot of emotion, um, I tend to write it in Spanish longhand first. Mm -hmm. uh, because I want to get it out, and then and then I, I go back and and, and translate it <laughs> into mm -hmm. English. Um, but it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what happens in the translation is that that you 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 reach a compromise basically uh, between uh, um, the emotion and at the same time you know that that kind of a, a structure that you want in good in good writing. Bueno, me gustaría decir algo no personal, no personal, sino algo que me parece muy importante y me parece en este país ahora mismo muy importante, está ocurriendo y es algo que nadie debe olvidar. Sería bonito olvidar, pero no se puede olvidar. La lengua es, entre otras cosas, una realidad política, una realidad política. Quiere decirse que dependiendo de quién esté en el poder, quién esté en la política, la situación de la lengua y por lo tanto la situación de pers personal de mucha gente cambia. Ayer encendí la televisión y salió un anuncio de, en Alabama y en Alabama el anuncio decía, yo entendí en inglés, eh, we don't want two languages in, in Alabama, we speak English, if they want to live here, learn, sh they should learn it, ¿no? Muy bien, luego salió una mujer hispana y dijo que no se atrevía a hablar español en el supermercado por miedo a que le pidieran los papeles, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Esto es importante, no es agradable, pero es importante. Eso puede influir en la vida de mucha gente. Yo he pasado por esa experiencia, yo he pasado por la experiencia de no hablar en alto mi lengua por miedo a la policía. Bueno... No es algo que haya ocurrido en el pasado ni en un rincón de Europa. Está ocurriendo aquí, en Alabama, y está ocurriendo con su comunidad. Bueno, esto, cada uno debe luego pensar estas, este tipo de, de materias, pero las materias están ahí. Puede uno decidir dar la espalda, opción aceptable, pero, pero está ahí la materia. No desaparece porque uno le dé la espalda. Eh, yo creo que hay que tener en cuenta, when I speak in about in the languages, we also you should speak ab about politics. You know? I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to respond to that. I, every, the whole time Bernardo was speaking, my heart was beating so fast because I agree with him and it just infuriates me. You know, I just came back from Lebanon mm -hmm. where people speak three languages. They speak mm -hmm. Arabic, they speak French, they speak English, and within Arabic, there's different dialects. So the person here from Yemen, if he tried to speak to me in Arabic, I probably wouldn't understand it. If I spoke my Egyptian, he might not understand it. So you, you have an Egyptian dialect, you have a Yemeni dialect, you have a Palestinian dialect, you have a... Ger so there's all these dialects in addition that people were speaking at this festival, and everybody understood. And it's such a rich culture and a rich country when you have all, this, all these languages and all these... And then I come to America, and they pass that law in Arizona where you have to be carrying your papers. And I thought, oh, wow, that kind of reminds me of my father having to carry his papers around after 1967 in Palestine, you know, mm -hmm. in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, it's not, what is happening here is not separate from the rest of the world. There's, there is this larger sort of 
you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to call it fascism, but definitely like racism. And there's, pa there's, it's about power and taking land over and all this stuff, and and keeping people who are indigenous to a land away from it. Um, someone was saying, can you imagine a Native American in Arizona stopping white people and being like, where are your papers? You know, yeah. um, what language you? Why aren't you speaking our tribal language? You know, I just wish America would. Uh, and, and these people that are saying this, I just wish people would see language as, as beauty and, and power, and, uh, but in a, different, in a different way. I know I'm sounding a little naive and, and emotional, but mm -hmm. that's how I feel about it. I just, wish, I just wish it was just part of our culture that we just all speak all these languages and you know, people wouldn't get mad when they pick up a phone and it says, press two for Spanish. Really? That pisses you off? I mean, <laughs> just ignore it, you know? <laughs> How many times have people who don't speak English have had to, had, had to ignore you? And another thing, you know, even just going to Europe, everybody, under, you know, everybody understands English, but you come here and it's like, you have to learn English. Well, I just feel like people should have to learn a different language. People who only know English should have to learn a different language. Mm -hmm. But that's just me. I totally agree. Learn Spanish. I totally agree. That's just. Uh, um, I, I actually, um, I want to turn back to a more sort of basic question. Um, um, and Francisco, you answered this a little bit. How did you become, um, how did you discover writing and how did, when did you decide to become a writer? I already told my story. Yeah, <laughs> told story, but some of you haven't. I yeah. kind of did. I, I'm, I'll, I'll just, just pick, I'll just pick yeah. it up. My yeah. dad always told me that I was going to be a writer because my dad yeah. was a terrible writer. He, was a, he thought he was a poet, but he was yeah. terrible. Um, and my mom told me this. She said, you know, your dad thinks that mm -hmm. I married him because he is a good poet. I just thought he was sexy, you know? It's <laughs> poetry, not so good. Um, so he always said, you're going to be a writer, you're going to be a writer. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to either, you know, sing or play, in, play instruments, but I was bad. I, was, I, had do I don't know how to sing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to play instruments. So uh, when I was very young, we had a creative writing class twice a week in my British school, and so I wrote in English. And whenever I would try to write in Arabic, um, my dad would actually rip up whatever I'd written because he said it wasn't good enough, and he would dictate Arabic to me, and I would that's how I would compose his stuff. So that's one of the reasons I think I translate from Arabic because, you know, I'm used to someone dictating something to me, and then I sort of write it down. So, um, and then when I went to high school, there were some really great English teachers who everybody hated. Mrs. Zugich, wherever you are, I love you. Um, Mrs. Well, now I don't remember her name. Mrs. P. <laughs> You're also awesome, too. They both just really supported me, told me, you know, write poetry or write fiction. And then I went to Sarah Lawrence, um, which is a college that, that, you know, you can just take fiction workshops every single semester if you want to. And I did that and then at some point decided, you know, I think, I, I think I'm ready to really um, put in the time to write a novel. Um, and so I think it was just a really long process with a lot of teachers supporting me and being kind to me and telling me I could do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I, I had a formative story like that. I think it comes back to being kind of isolated with different cult two different cultures in Texas and like having a lot of time uh, to myself, you know, and I think writers have a lot of time to themselves and as they figure out the world and, you know, even not doing great in school early on, but being in my head a lot and wanting to do something. Mm -hmm. And then I connected with the Betty story too because girls were always a good motivation, you know, and like, <laughs> and wanting like Jennifer Gover more than anything, life itself, this girl next door. I think I could have been a good student, but I stay like hours just waiting for her to walk by next my next door neighbor girl and not being able to get her, you know, like not having the confidence, not feeling like, you know, like some of the, you play a lot of American football in Texas and I wasn't so good at football. I like basketball more. And so I didn't, I wasn't the jock that got the girl. And I think that could be kind of a cool thing for a writer because then I started writing stories and like listening to sad music, that longful music, you know, and wanting, and then the other thing too, and I just thought of this uh, with, you know, the gift of the two languages and two cultures. My father was, you know, his, his uh, older brother was killed in the revolution in Iran that he was hiding in a closet. They came and got him and assassinated. And he, I didn't know any of this. I just saw him have like a breakdown in front of me, you know, like what's happening to my, my dad. 
And then like he would come pick me up from my my basketball practice or whatever, and he'd be playing this sad Persian music, like the saddest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, mm-hmm. sadder than country music, sadder than any kind of ballad, sadder than the blues. And then he'd and he's smoking cigarettes secretly, you know, and and I'd come up like, hey dad, you know, and to his Datsun or his Buick, and he turned the tape player off. And you like clear the smoke, like it's nothing. I'm like, what is that sad music? Like, I didn't understand it at the time, but my heart connected to it and it spoke to what my father was doing. And now, like in the Persian poetry, I hear that kind of that connection to the heart. And music, I think, is like that. And I think even though poetry is difficult, it can cut through a lot of the the BS, you know, and we can connect to it. I know I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I can catch the gist of what our gentleman's saying and uh, because I grew up in San Antonio, but I can I can hear like a certain music in a language I don't exactly understand, and it gets me. I, like I know in some way the tone is there, and I think that's what that was my entry point into writing is the musicality and like wanting something to sing inside of me that wasn't quite there. And it's a great way to learn another language too, like connecting, follow whatever you really connect to, like in a, in a certain culture in a language. Um, I was wondering if the authors could give advice to the students Mm -hmm. on how to start writing, how to become a better writer, Mm -hmm. what they should be doing now in school to overcome their fears of writing in English and what your experience has been and what has helped you. Bueno, responderé en español. Creo que hay algo decisivo en la escritura para ser escritor, es que la escritura es una acción, es una acción. Es decir, que lo que hay que hacer para escribir es justamente escribir. Y si todos los días escribe usted un folio, eh, al cabo de cinco años puede tener una novela. Es así. De nada sirve el prolegómeno, ¿sabe usted? De nada sirven los prólogos, pensar apuntar ideas, un cuaderno, otro cuaderno, bueno, no. Hay que decir, voy a escribir una novela y hay que ponerse a ello. Y si no tiene ganas, doble tiempo le tiene que dedicar a la novela. Es decir, es un esfuerzo escribir, es un esfuerzo tremendo. Y hay que escribir sin ganas, con ganas, con buen tiempo, con mal tiempo, en domingo, en sábado. Es la única forma de escribir. La segunda es que cuando ya termina la novela, se lo tiene que usted, tiene usted que dárselo a un buen amigo, simpático y amable, y, y además a un buen amigo que no es ni simpático ni amable. Entonces usted toma la decisión, por ahí, eh, no, nunca se le ocurra, por ejemplo, dar la novela a dos amigos antipáticos y agresivos, porque entonces usted la chafará, lo chafará, vamos, dejará usted de escribir. Siempre hace falta un amigo bueno y un amigo no tan bueno para uno mostrar los defectos y el otro res- resaltar las virtudes. Pero son los dos, a mi modo de ver, las dos únicas formas de escribir. Es escribiendo y luego corrigiendo o luego contrastando lo que se escribe. Y en diez años se tiene una buena novela, yo creo. Roger said everything that I wanted to say. Just keep, keep a journal and write every day. I think also don't be so hard on yourself while you're writing, especially if you're trying to write in English. Just, you know, just write whatever you want and don't sort of be self-conscious because being self-conscious just makes you... It stops you from really performing at your best. Have you ever tried to, like, dance while being self-conscious? You're like... (laughs) Then when no one's around, you're like... (laughs) What's up? You're probably like a much better dancer when no one's around, right? So it's better to just, when you're writing, try to remove that critical person in your head that maybe is a person from school or a teacher or something. The critical person in your head needs to be removed while you're creating. And then after you create, as Bernardo was saying, you show it to someone, someone nice and someone not nice. So after you create, you, you can revise. And it's important to revise because now we have Word, which is this, this amazing program on our computers. Even if you're not writing fiction, even if you're writing an essay for school, don't just write the essay two hours before class. I've done it. I know you're doing it. Don't write your essay two hours before class. Write it if you, if you have to. Write it maybe five hours before class 
I mean, if that's what you're really going to do. And then give yourself an hour off and then go back and look at your essay mm. again and try to fix it because you have, we don't have rocks now. You don't have to get a stick and like hammer out every single letter and then bring this rock to your teacher. You can actually use word programming, delete things, revise things, print them out, print them out, print, you know, try, try to have the, if you don't have the resources, go to the library, find a place where you can have a resource where you can use a computer, use Word, revise and print and give yourself a chance to say what you mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's worth it. What you, mean, what you say is worth it. Okay, what you have to say in this world is important. And if you don't think so, then who the hell is going to think so, right? You have to think that what you say is important. And if you think it's important, then you're going to revise it. You're going to look at it again, and you're going to fix it. I'd say the same thing as everybody else is saying. Stay with it. And not just if you want to be a, a writer, like a famous writer or whatever. It, just to master a language, if you're uncomfortable like with English or another language, stay with it. I mean, there's hard evidence that it's just practice. It's not about being smarter or, you know, uh, not about like not being intelligent. It just is practice and immersion. And I love, you know, letting your interest lead you. Like, I learned how to write before, you know, I'm supposed to tell you I learned like Shakespeare and I wanted to study and be Shakespeare. I wanted to be like a rock and roll star, you know, and like how I love lyrics to songs and stuff, you know, and I like, let me, let me try to write like this, you know, letting your interest lead you. And even that's a trick in school I learned. I wish I would have learned it earlier, but like, you have to be in school and you have to learn the stuff they're trying to teach you, but trying to like crack the system a little bit to the, skew it to like how it works for you, you know, like, yeah, I have to be here, but what am I going to, what am I interested in and, and what's cool about this? And the last thing I'll say too, it's like, we were talking about oppression in this country and it's so empowering, you know, even to feel put upon, like I have to learn English in school or whatever. It's so empowering to master the language because then you take back the power that they're trying to exert on you. In this country, Frederick Douglass, right, enslaved, an enslaved African American, he wrote, he learned how to read and write and wrote his own slave pass and, tr you know, basically tricked the system. You know, there's so many versions of, of that story in different ways. And I think even as a writer, you learn how to kind of trick the publishing industry in a way. You know, like, this is how I talk and maybe it's different, or this is my background and maybe it's different, but it's cool for me. And, and you know, I believe in it. And following your heart is, is really big. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is all great advice, like using a journal and just, you know, and also just like writing, you know, there's not, there's no subject that's sacred, like write whatever is around you, whether it's like how crazy your mom is or, you know, that's always, <laughs> that's always a favorite subject of mine, for instance, you know, or like, you know, or, you know, or, um, you know, you're, you're the person you have a crush on, like the heartbreak <laughs> poem, you know, it's not like you don't have to write that poem about you know, Einstein or the Brooklyn Bridge or something, or, you, you know, you don't have to copy Shakespeare. I think the most honest kind of writing is just writing what you see, what you know, what's around you, you know. So other other questions? Para usted, ¿qué fue lo que le motivó a escribir? And just estoy hablando. ¿Qué es lo que te motivó? ¿Qué fue lo que le motivó bueno, a escribir? Bueno, eh, lo primero que me gustaría decir es que empezar no es tan difícil. Empezar no es difícil. Normalmente se empieza a escribir cuando hay un sentimiento que uno no acaba de comprender. Es típico en el enamoramiento, pero puede ser por un sentimiento diferente, por ejemplo, de pena, ¿no? Cuando uno, hay un sentimiento que le desborda a uno, normalmente se pone a escribir. Pero ese no es. El, ahí no está, como dice en español, la madre del cordero no está ahí. La madre del cordero está en seguir. ¿Cómo sigue uno escribiendo? Cuando, sobre todo, desde la adolescencia hasta que uno encuentra trabajo, por ejemplo, son años muy duros en los que la persona se tiene que dedicar a formarse, a estudiar, a trabajar, no queda tiempo... Bueno, entonces el problema es empezar a escribir y para, y, y para seguir escribiendo. Y para seguir escribiendo es muy importante buscarse encargos, ¿sabe usted? Obligarse a escribir. Eh, es decir, si hay una revista municipal, decir, voy a escribir un artículo para esa revista municipal. Y si hay un amigo que canta, como fue mi caso, que yo tenía muchos grupos a mi alrededor, decirles, yo hago las, los lyrics, voy a hacer las letras, 
obligarte a escribir, encargarte trabajos, ¿no? Commission, se dice en inglés, ¿no? Comisionarte trabajos. Y esa es, me parece, la única forma de, de, de escribir, seguir escribiendo. Luego cada uno, o, 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 obviamente, tiene su, como decimos, su punto secreto, ¿no? ¿Por qué quiere uno escribir? Bueno, por ejemplo, en mi caso le diré algo que es, parece una tontería y sin embargo para mí ha sido decisivo, y es las letras, ah, vamos a ver, los títulos de las canciones cuya letra no entendía. Es decir, que yo veía, por ejemplo, The Empty Sky. Yo luego no sabía qué decía la canción, pero aquello me, me motivaba, me daba una serie de imágenes y pensaba, Empty Sky, y me imaginaba la letra, ¿no? o en francés, ¿no? Eh, le le plape y quiere le mien, que cantaba Jacques Brel. ¿Qué será eso del llano país que es el mío? Bueno, entonces, como no acaba de entender las letras, yo hacía una especie de movimiento reflejo mental y hacía como las letras posibles de esos títulos. The House of the Rising Sun, The Dos Animals. Bueno, yo cuando oía esa canción ya escribí un montón de versiones y ninguna coincidía. Ese fue un poco el motor poético. Pero lo, mi suerte fue que me obligué a escribir y que hasta los 30 años, como se dice en español, daba la lata a todo el mundo ofreciendo mis, eh, eh, mis poemas, mis textos, mis cuentos, me obligaba a escribir. Y luego ya, poco a poco vas aprendiendo y vas publicando mejor. Y, eh, importante continuar. Bueno. The last question is coming from just over here, where after we'll have book signing. Hi, um, this question is for all the authors. Um, for the lady in the purple, I'm sorry, I forgot your Rhonda. name. Rhonda. Rhonda, yeah. Um, earlier, like when you were saying, um, when the Spanish show, when, cuando te estaba hablando, when you said that it made your heart skip about when he was talking about um, what's happening in Arizona with the new law that they passed, How did writing help you guys? Like, how did writing help you guys get through like the like the dilemma that you had throughout your life with almost like the discrimination and some of racism about like you not being able to speak English and stuff like that? That's a really that's a really really good question, and it's hard to answer. Um, first of all, when I was a teenager, I really wanted to read a book like my book. I just I would go to the library and I would like I just would like look on the computer for Arab American writers. I just couldn't find any. You know, I just couldn't find any. And even the ones I found weren't like me. They just I didn't see myself and I tell the story a lot. You know, when you go to a, a you know, an amusement park or something, you go to the place where they have the keychains and the mugs and they have all the names on them. You know, my name Randa, that wasn't on any of the mugs or the keychains. So like My book is basically my way of making my own little mug or keychain, sort of in a bigger way, um, to sort of say, this is a story that deserves to exist, and I have to write it for it to exist. No one else is going to write my story. No one else is going to write this or tell this. And one of the great things about being a writer, I think, is you get respect, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I was just at this other festival, and people there were kind to me and nice to me. And as soon as I left the festival, You know, when I was at the airport, people weren't nice to me. You know, when I was on the airplane, people told me I was fat, right? So when I'm not a writer, when I'm not a writer, when I'm in the outside world, I'm an Arab, I'm fat, and I'm treated with like like crap, basically. If I'm not, I don't know if that makes sense. When I'm when I am a writer, and I am stepping up as a writer, I feel like I finally get some respect in this world because otherwise, I'm just this, you know, whatever, someone who doesn't have that much money, who takes up too much space, or whatever. Um, I hope I'm communicating this properly, <laughs> but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like writing is finally giving me the respect that I deserve as a human being, and I feel like that's what art does. You know, it, 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 you know, it, it'll, it singles you out in a way that's good, and then you can finally get some respect. That's how I feel about it. That was a, that's a great question, too. And I was just thinking, too, like, you know, clearing up stereotypes, I think, is important. You know, there's, you say Iran, and all, all of a sudden, like, are you a terrorist? Are you this? You know, you that? And having, being a writer, whether you like it or not, you're on a platform, you know, and people are, are, you know, you guys, I guess, had to come see us, but, you know, you come see you, and it's like, all of a sudden, I, I want to be a voice and say, yeah, he's Iranian, and he's not, you know, maybe he's, he's more like me than I thought. 
it's not unlike, you know, being a, a great ball player from the Dominican Republic, you know, and like, yeah, I'm coming to America and I'm kicking ass, you know, and like, and I come from a family and a background and maybe it's not like your background in America, but it's someplace very real. And the last thing, and it's really related to what Rondo was saying with clearing up stereotypes and also being a voice in a way I've never thought I would. And I came to my office last, last week and this junior from Sarah Lawrence had visited my campus. She tried, he, or he tried to find me and I'm keeping this note. It made me cry. The I won't cry now, but I probably, but it was just basically like, this is a Pakistani student and they had to leave Pakistan for persecution. And this is an aspiring poet. And he's thanking me uh, because finally, like he's finding his voice and realizing he can write about something that he thought was taboo. It changed my life. I mean, it's better than like being reviewed in the New York Times. I was just like, and I didn't think that would possible, but like you were saying, like, what's the book I want to read and let me write that? And I think artists do that a lot. Like, what's the song I want to listen to? What's the movie I want to watch? You know, and hey, I'm in that movie or my people are in the movie. You know, it's, it was a really cool, empowering thing to be a writer in that way. So. You know, there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can get involved in, in trying to correct a, 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 a wrong that you see in society, you know, mm -hmm. through politics, through act, activity. Uh, sometimes you don't think of writing as a way of, of getting involved, but it's, it's, it's my way of, of, uh, of getting involved. Um, it's not carrying a sign and it's not, you know, perhaps uh, being out there. Uh, protesting and so forth, but it's it's a, it's a way that I can reach a lot of people, uh, and in a, in a in a very subtle way, change the images that they may have about what who they are discriminating about. All my characters are are Latino Latino kids, you know, and uh, the things that they go through and and their um, the way that I portray them, even though I deal with with their problems, it's it's clear that I love them, you know. <laughs> And, and and I think that that love is uh, uh, that love comes across. And, and when somebody when somebody reads, when, what happens in the book is that you become you become part of that character in many ways. You empathize with them, and you get to know their heart and their soul. So when they know a, a kid, uh, you know, that is different uh, from the way that they they look and they speak, but they get to know the the way that they feel and think. Um, their their ideas of discrimination may may start to change. So that's my way of uh, of giving back. Well, no, in few words, I think that uh, literature uh, writing is attractive because it's very difficult. You know. Yes, I think that it's very difficult to write a novel or even a, a good poem. So if you start, you be, uh, began begin uh, writing. And uh, you you should go on, and you you should work a lot, and and it's so I don't know pregnant, so hypnotical, this this task that I think it's enough for for living. I think uh, it's enough. Yeah, I don't need anything else. Maybe sometimes a good opinion about my poems or my novels or some money for, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the most important point is to, to the, 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 the wish, no? wish mm -hmm. to go on, to, mm -hmm. to get the poem, no? mm -hmm. I think. No? Mm -hmm. If you write a poem now, today, and next year, no? uh, a year later, you, you, you read it again, and ah, and you think ah, it's good, it, it works, uh, it's a very, very good feeling, and, and it's enough, it's a great thing for, for living. You know, I mean, Rhonda, you know, when you were talking about before about how it sucks to be in the States sometimes because there's so much discrimination and how people are like, oh, people shouldn't speak Spanish, you know, and everyone should be American and speak English. By writing, writing is a way of just fighting back, you know, and having your voice heard. And it's, you know, and it's also, you know, as a way of connecting to others as well. So. There was one last question. No? Because we are so short on time, and we do want to get a chance to have our book signed. <sighs> okay, you. okay. So, Thank you very much.